introduce um, the man of the hour, <laughs> Carl, because it is his book that is being launched, and so it's fitting that we clap before he even comes up. So, <laughs> so I'm going to read a little uh, bio. It's very modest. It does not capture everything that Carla has done, not even close. He's one of the treasures, at least of my generation, and um, it's impossible to write a synthesis of what you've done, Carl. Carl Jurgens is the former English department head and former chair of the creative writing program at the University of Windsor. He's author of three books of fiction and two scholarly books from Coach House, Mercury, ECW, and the Porcupine School Presses. Jurgens edited Rampike, a literary arts and theory journal for many years. He also edited two books on painter Jack Bush and poet Christopher Dugney, plus an issue of Open Letter magazine with Beatrice Housen. He was recently advised that his poetry is to be included in the best Canadian poetry anthology from Biblioasis Press. His scholarly and creative texts are published globally. His latest book, which we'll read from now, is titled The Razor's Edge. So please welcome Carl Jones. Thanks very much. Very neat. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight in spite of uh, Toronto's weird traffic. It's just been insane here. Um, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I drove in from uh, Windsor to Toronto and uh, things haven't changed much in terms of traffic situations. But I was highly disappointed to see how bad it got on uh, College Street, for example. Anyway, but thank you for being here and being brave enough to show up, so I really appreciate it. Um, I'll begin by saying uh, a rhyming poem, which you're not supposed to do these days, but I will anyway. Scintillating semantique is the thing that does the treat. Grand eloquent fecundity fills the ear most pleasantly, but we all best accentuate when clearly we enunciate. Lecture, preach, pray, and teach. Fill the room up with your speech. Jibber jabber like a monkey. Talk the hind leg off a donkey. We've all heard some great orations, speakers, clever declarations, recitations, exhortations, wisely worded perorations. Only one thing you got to know, whether you come or whether you go, as language is as language does. There ain't no need to make a fuss, provided your vernacular is acoustically spectacular. <laughs> I like that one. I got here and then I found out I had a hole in my sock. Doesn't that drive you crazy? You drive around and then you go, oh, how did I get a hole in my sock? Oh my gosh. You know, whenever I get that at home, I just go change my socks. But no, I can't do that now. I'm at a show. Oh well, so I got a hole in my sock. Anyway, so, um, I was recently invited to uh, a workshop for sound poetry. I'm not really a sound poetry specialist, but uh, I have done some in the past, and uh, I was asked to do a workshop for the Arts Council in Windsor. And so while I was there, I mentioned several of Toronto's and Hamilton's sound poets, some of whom are with us tonight. Um, so I dedicate this very short sound poem to all of you. Okay, I got a new book out. It says, hold up book cover. Okay. <laughs> it's called The Razor's Edge from Porcupine Squill. And special thanks to my publishing team at Porcupine Squill, including Stephanie Small, El Elkett Inkster, Tim Inkster, whose prize-winning book designs always draw wonderful responses. Recently, I read in Toronto for 100,000 Poets for Change. Uh, it was on September 25th. And this book reacts to many of the problems in the world and asks for change in the way we respond to our many crises. Uh, this collection of short stories, The Razor's Edge, responds to Somerset Mom's novel of the same title. And like Mom's protagonist, the narrator in this suite of uh, short stories is traumatized by the state of the world and is on a quest for greater meaning. 
the excerpt that I'll read from is timely because it, because uh, what happened so to so many of Russia's independent neighbors during World War II, including the Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, is again happening in Ukraine. Uh, the situation is very similar. Um, meantime, I'll put in a plug here. I'm part of a group of writers who are responding to the peril in Ukraine, and that group includes uh, one of our authors tonight, Gary Barwin, who read just a few minutes ago. We're all in this anthology edited by Richard uh, Yves Sotosky and legendary Penn Kemp, entitled Poems in Peril, Response to Peril. Um, the Peril editors are doing a series of readings and launches with funds that donated to Ukraine's war effort, and I'm part of the, their next uh, presentation, which is in London, Ontario's WordFest on Saturday, November 9th, 5th. Uh, and here's a short poem from that collection titled Frailty. Desires and common wants slavishly follow our beings, boiling frailties within our frailties, echoing who, what we are, unnervingly making lucid parts unknown, confronting us with our own dread. Some seek to master such imagos, seek strength, beauty, truth, while clinging to what isn't there, what never was. Such unfastened desires, perhaps better to embrace frailty, adore each other for what we cannot be. Okay, and here's a bit from The Razor's Edge from the story titled The Freshness of a Dream. This is very short, uh, so I'll read you a little bit of it just as an appetizer. Speaking of appetizers, eat some of the food over there. <laughs> My mother and I are sitting in, at her kitchen table. She sits with her back to a glass storm door. I gaze at the tangled garden behind her. My mother is quietly crocheting a hat for my son. She peers through her glasses. Her old fingers nimbly turn the wool, strands on light metal crochet hooks. It's time for another tea, but I'm held in place by a strange inertia. To break the inertia, I ask her what happened to her brother during the war, my Uncle Joe. She fed me small pieces of that story before, but I hunger for more. My uncle had been fighting with the partisans, first against the Nazis, then the Soviets. My mother informed me that he was tossed into a mass grave, only to be retrieved. The entire nation had been forcibly occupied. The bulldozer driver, a patriot, was ordered by a Soviet commander to cover up dozens of bodies. The bulldozer driver refused. He'd witnessed several fingers moving on my uncle's left hand. They threatened to kill the dozer driver, but he rejected the threat. I'm the only bulldozer driver for hundreds of kilometers. If you kill me, you'll have mass contagion. The commander shrugged, relented, but remained pissed off. He ordered a pair of soldiers to haul my uncle's body out of the trench. The dozer driver ensured they hospitalized him. My mother told me my uncle was among several partisans sitting in the back of a resistance truck, the kind with a canvas tarpaulin covering the back. The truck driver inadvertently trundled up to an unexpected military checkpoint. Realizing the danger, the driver stopped on the gas, swerved past the checkpoint barrier, but one of the ground troops managed to lob a grenade. My uncle was near the front of the truck bed. Knocked unconscious, he was bloody, blinded, crippled on his right side. Bodies of the other partisans shielded him. I wanted to know more. My mother kept crocheting. Tell me more about what happened to Uncle Joe. I'll stop there. If you want to know how it ends, I guess you'll have to get the book. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. Uh, <clears throat> the next piece uh, offers a, a short depiction of my father who was dying of Parkinson's disease in a nursing home in Windsor. I had him transported there from Sudbury, because I live in Windsor now. Uh, this is I'm originally from Toronto, in West End. Tran, that's how you say it. I, I, I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Tran. T-R-A-W-N-A. Uh, so this is uh, a short excerpt of a longer piece that's titled Father's Day, and this bit will be in my next book. It was published in a U.S. journal called The TypeScript. It was also awarded uh, inclusion in the Best Canadian Poetry Anthology of 2023. Um, and so it's a, a prose poem. Here's the excerpt. It's Father's Day again. In my dreams, I see my father standing there surveying the auto light atop a tripod, up in Sudbury, far from Riga. He ran for his life, and now he's in this place, 
in bed, aged 90, with Parkinson's. He stutters, words break in his mouth, he can barely walk. When he does, he staggers, falls into the wheelchair. He thinks he's 99, he's not. He thinks he's going to work today, he's not. He thinks he's late for work, he's not. He thinks he's in Riga, he's not. His eyeglasses no longer serve, he can't focus. He insists that his toothbrush must be exactly 5.88 millimeters, no more, no less. He's lying in bed, in diapers, trousers round his ankles, unable to stand, not good at moving. He tells me he dreamt that he walked around the room, walked outside, smelled point fresh air on the family farm. He hasn't been on that farm since 1942. He has no idea what year it is. I tell him to read my calendar book. The date is clearly posted, but he can't focus. He thinks it's 1945. It's not. He thinks he's 99 years old. He's 90. He thinks the clock is wrong. It's not. He thinks he has to go to work. He doesn't. He thinks his wife works every day. She doesn't. He thinks people are stealing stuff from his bathroom. They're not. He thinks he's signed numerous legal documents. He hasn't. He thinks I've written my address on the wall. I have not. I explain all of this to him. Slowly, carefully, he only half listens. It takes time. I think I'm going to get a parking ticket. I don't. <laughs> Now here's a lighter piece from my uh, chapbook, Eco Blues, A Tale in Three Parts, uh, published by Above Ground Press in Ottawa. I have copies of this chapbook available with me. And uh, if you want one, just come on over to my table. It's right over there. <coughs> so um, this is sort of semi-serious because it's about ecology, but it's also supposedly funny. I don't know. I think it's funny, but, uh, well... We'll see. Um, and it's the short, uh, this short excerpt is about a protagonist who goes for a job interview at the University of Toronto, but on the way their car gets stuck behind a garbage truck, and then something magical happens. The piece was originally called Putting on the Ritz, but I changed the title to What the Garbage Buddha Said. <laughs> it's under five minutes long, and here's the excerpt. At the edge of the city is a massive garbage dump, a landfill, a wasteland, and in the midst of it there's a mountain basking in sunlight, Buddha-like. The garbage Buddha contemplates all the garbage that is and all that one day will be garbage. Listen to the garbage Buddha's chant. Om Amo Ga Siddhi Ahom. All that is, is garbage. All that will be, will be garbage. The things that are not yet garbage will one day become garbage. No one is an island. We are peninsulas connected to our garbage. We are the garbage that is now. I am the ungarbage that one day will become garbage. Garbage and ungarbage are one. Om Amo Ga Siddhi Bahum. This morning I awoke, dressed, fed the dog, drove the car to a, jo a job interview. My car, a gray, unassuming 2003 Mercury, has slow, low mileage. I seldom drive. It's not a sedan you've noticed. It's a generic car. But it's the car that I'm driving to my job interview. I'm driving with a swift and composed economy of motion along Bloor Street in Toronto. I'm heading downtown for an appointment at the University of Toronto. They seek a specialist in literary theory. If I keep up the pace, I'll make it on time. I could have taken the subway, but I wanted to keep cool in the car. The air conditioning still works somewhat, although it seems weak lately. Some of the air conditioner's tetrafluoroethane molecules must have found their way into the ozone layer and helped widen the hole in the sky that permits cosmic rays to pour down on my head. I tell myself that inside the car it's still cooler than outside. Toronto summers are torrid and muggy. I'm making good time, but there's a slowdown. I swerve around several vehicles to get to the problem, but I'm unable to pass. A garbage truck is pausing in front of every building. The truck is too wide and its pace too slow to scoot past while avoiding oncoming traffic. I give it the horn, but the truck ignores me and continues in oblivious elephantine fashion, lumbering up the street, pausing, stopping, moving. CBC Radio predicts rain. I think I made a wise choice taking the car. I tell myself, this is typical city traffic, but I'm getting anxious about the interview. In the rearview mirror, I see cars lining up, and, I, and in front of me, the garbage truck, like some otherworldly beast, leisurely grazing on the savannah. 
I catch myself losing balance. I'm about to lean on the horn and keep leaning until the truck allows me to pass. I take a deep breath, regain equilibrium. I tell myself I shouldn't be driving in the first place. I could have taken the subway, but I wanted to look fresh for my job interview. And it might rain. I didn't want to show up rain-soaked, but it was my choice. I However, I never anticipated this truck, this garbage. Garbage, it's a daily thing, a general condition of entropy, an entropic universe, a breakdown of stuff. I think about recycling, I think about David Suzuki, I think about what David Suzuki once said. David Suzuki once said, we are heading for an ecological disaster of unparalleled proportions. Metaphorically speaking, he said, it's as if we're heading in an automobile towards a concrete bridge abutment at over 100 miles an hour and all we do is argue about where we sit in the car, or words to that effect. But I'm not hurtling, I'm inching, inching in an O3 Mercury behind a dawdling garbage truck. I turn up the air conditioner, it doesn't respond. I suspect that over the years the seals of the air conditioning unit have collapsed, and one by one molecules of tetrafluoroethane have escaped, are escaping even now, leaving a few remaining hard-working molecules in the machine and those few molecules are feeling lonely, abandoned. And soon there will be too few molecules to keep me cool. I imagine the last molecule of tetrafluoroethane liberating itself from the air conditioning unit, rising free into the hot city smog, dancing happily with other gas molecules, monoxides, dioxides, all together in a molecular fandango, rising towards the stratosphere, finally free, free from all of this. There will come a day when all but one molecule will have escaped, leaving the air conditioning to a single molecule all alone in the stifling dark. I remember some parties ending that way. <laughs> I'll jump ahead a bit. Then the protagonist notices something strange about the garbage collector. I'm watching the garbage collector as I inch behind the truck. Maybe Japanese. One of my best friends in college was Japanese. I think of ontolinguistics and clones as something I can talk about at the job interview. The collector looks my, like my best friend, but I don't think this garbage collector is my former pal. My friend is now an industrial psychologist working in Ottawa. As far as I know, they're not working on a garbage truck in Toronto. But this person in front of me with the orange coveralls, long dark hair, and mirror aviator shades moves so lightly. As the truck periodically surges ahead, the collector jumps, leaps from the back of the truck, returning to the tailgate with cat-like precision, perfect timing, swinging a leg, one arm comfortably looped in a large metal hand grip, one shoe perched solidly on the running board, occasionally facing backwards, then pirouetting to the other side of the truck, cool, smiling as I try to pass. But oncoming traffic is still too heavy. The collector does a half-step twist, pirouettes to the running board's other side with a graceful ballet move, flawlessly shifting with an economy of motion, elegant physical equilibrium, I'm thinking cross-cultural identities, surrealism, and representational derationalization. As I'm focusing on those rhythmic movements, the radio catches my ear. Ella Fitzgerald is singing, putting on the Ritz. Everything comes into focus. The garbage collector moves in harmony with the music. I still have my window up, so I know they can't hear. But the garbage ballet is in perfect sync with the radio tune, a terpsichore of trash. Let's all go where Rockefellers walk with sticks and umbrellas in white mitts. Aristocratic swank. The collection of refuse becomes a fluid synth pop jive ballet. The music fits in white mitts, putting on the Ritz. I laugh. The garbage collector notices. I'm thinking fiction, friction, invisibility pop, representation, la la, Fred Astaire, spats and cane, top hat and tails along the avenue. An elegant dismount followed by two hefty orange bags pitched on board without breaking tempo. I'm thinking millennium anxiety, posh tap dance, post-romantic transcendence, transhuman rubbish sublime. The collector's feet hover above the ground. Are those white sweat socks or do I see little white wings at the ankles? A grin and mug targeted straight at me, posturing, swinging to the other side of the truck, eyes peering over mirrored aviator shades, watching for a reaction maybe seeking applause. A Hermes of refuse sending me an inscrutable message. I realize that the collector knows how talented they are, hamming mercurial. I smile as the truck pulls over and stops for a colony of garbage cans. I wheel by and give a small wave. One of the collector's white mitts waves back. It has taken forever. 
The collector dumps a garbage can of loose confetti into the hopper. A flurry of paper bits fills the air. As I pull past, a gentle snow has begun to fall. It is winter. I am eight months late for my job interview. <laughs> Thanks, and my supermarket time is up. I hope you enjoyed the food, and please help yourself to more. Uh, please buy books, because the book trade is what keeps us writers writing. We do have signing tables for our guest authors. I know some of us are giving away books. Okay, I don't see any hands. So, okay, so that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.